So episode 6 of the Acolyte is finally here and we need to break it down, so let's get straight into it. We begin the episode with Osha waking up in a panic which mirrors the way she woke up all the way back in episode 1 when Mei managed to kill Master Indara. And I'm pretty sure this was shot intentionally to signal a new beginning and chapter on Osha's story, potentially the beginning of a darker path. Osha's wounds are patched and she surveys what appears to be Kamir's home, and in many ways it is a home of someone in exile. She is presented with a set of clothes including a knife, the same type used by Mei to perform assassinations, which definitely symbolizes Kamir's desire for her to be the new acolyte. And Mei's decision to take them perhaps foreshadows her eventual fall to the dark side. As Osha stops to observe her surroundings, we see in front of her what looks to be guardrails, which is quite interesting considering that Star Wars doesn't really usually do guardrails. Sol and Mei leave Kofar and Sol tries to get in contact with the Jedi on Coruscant and we hear the code 5112 and Sol uses Emergency Code Zero. And Emergency Code Zero is an interesting one because it's also the code used by the Empire which signals ships to divert from its current task and assist in whatever situation is going on. The communication doesn't really go through due to some sort of interference. As Mei walks around the ship, she nearly tries to kill Sol but is stopped when he turns around to tell her to take the wheel. And Sol likely is yet to sense that it is not Osha but Mei simply because he's not quite in the right state of mind. The recent events and encounter with Kamir have rattled him quite a bit and so it's not surprising that it has weakened him further. Sol resets the transceiver and displays a rare flash of anger as he hits the controls, again just indicating how unbalanced his character is. Basil gets Pip recharged and Osha tries to follow Kamir who decides to take a bath and we see a nasty shaped scar on his back. Kamir reveals that he knows she was following him all this time and as Osha picks up Kamir's lightsaber, he starts to coach her on her stance which really just speaks to his confidence in potentially handling Osha as well as his desire to train Osha as his acolyte. Kamir also begins to somewhat read her mind and he tells her that her anger betrays her thoughts, which is quite reminiscent of Palpatine's own way of manipulating Luke. Osha asks if Sol and Mei is still alive and Kamir takes note that she asked about them in that specific order, which is another way he sort of manages to get into her head to figure out who she cares more for. And it is perhaps the fact that she cares more for Sol than Mei which appeals to Kamir as his previous acolyte Mei cared more about her own sister than her own master. Kamir also hints at the special relationship between Osha and Sol, master and pupil, which speaks to his own yearning of such a relationship while at the same time potentially detesting his old master, but more on that later. We can also take a step further that Kamir's hint might also suggest that Sol is somewhat of a father figure to Osha. So tells Mei that he thinks it is time to admit to the High Council what really happened that night on Brandok, but before he can go further, he is interrupted by a transmission from Coruscant that refers to his ship as Poland GX-8, but the ship's power fails conveniently, which could be a common issue the ship is facing, which was also referenced in the beginning of the show. You could try repolarizing the power couplings. Sol tells Mei to take a look which makes sense as Osha was a mech neck and would have been much better at solving such things. We cut back to Master Venestra who is dealing with some High Republic politics and we learn that a senator by the name of Senator Rayancor has been advocating for greater oversight over the Jedi due to his anti-Jedi sentiments. Now we don't know much about Rayancor but the name was mentioned in the High Republic book Defy the Storm. We also learn from the Abed Nido Senator Chu Want that the expansion region will be in favor of this new policy. Now the expansion region refers to a region between the core and the mid rim including the planet of Umbara which was featured in the Clone Wars. Chu Wan tells her to not be too worried and that this was just another case of another senator grasping for power, but it really is a growing concern for the Jedi as the greater the oversight the greater the leash, potentially preventing the Jedi from acting independently as a force for good and becoming more of a political extension of the Republic. Which again speaks to the growing involvement of the Jedi in Republic politics which leads the Jedi Order to where it is in the prequels. 
The conversation is interrupted when Jedi Padawan Mog reports to Venestra about Sol's transmission and the bad news. But it is interesting to note that Venestra's Padawan wasn't even aware that his own master knew where Sol was, really just reflecting how top secret that mission was. We cut back to Osha and Kamir, and Kamir admits that he was once a Jedi a long time ago, which does potentially hint at who his master might be. Kamir seemingly gives Osha the option to leave, which is a facade as he knows that he has enticed her enough that she will stay. After all, for a person hell-bent on killing anyone who knows his identity, it doesn't quite make sense that he would easily let her go. Basil attacks Mei with the help of Pip, but Pip gets reprogrammed by Mei. Kamir talks about how the Jedi teach only one way to use the Force and have ended up with a monopoly on how to use the Force, not permitting other forms of interpretation. And in some ways this is true, and partly why the witches had to move out from the jurisdiction of the Republic in order to practice their religion. Kamir also mentions using powerful emotions to wield the Force, which is very much in line with the Sith philosophy, especially hate and anger. Kamir tempts Osha to kill her, and while Osha initially resists, he manages to bait her and play on her emotions to get her to almost lash out in anger, playing on her leaving the Jedi Order and her rejection, and Osha finally admits that she failed, igniting the lightsaber. The failure she is referring to here is really the failure to let go, the failure to let go of her past and move on from it. Ma cautions Venestra on her sickness during hyperspace travel and she tells him she just finds it unsettling. And this is referring to her ability to navigate hyperspace lanes using the Force, and so being particularly sensitive to this in space, it may very well be unsettling every time she travels. In the background, we can see a Selkath, which is an alien species first introduced in the KOTOR games and later reintroduced in the Clone Wars. Sol asks why he wasn't able to sense Kamir's true intentions back on Olega, blaming himself for what happened, and Mei actually offers a pretty good piece of advice, stating that when you want something so much, it clouds your judgement, which is probably advice that she can take herself, and might hint at the possibility that she might be redeemable. Sol says you found him, which initially sounds like he already figured out that Mei is an Osha before redirecting the question to Pip, and while it sounds like a close miss, I do think that Sol already somewhat realizes that it is not Osha that he is talking to. Mei tries to get Sol to spill the beans on what happened that night, but just before he does, the power turns back on. This leads to Sol stunning Mei, with Basil likely confirming his suspicions. Sol then decides to turn his transponder off, loses the Jedi following him, and his decision to do so is quite weird. Now, besides the fact that he isn't in the right state of mind, it might also suggest that his guilt of not detecting Kamir's true intentions, and arguably causing the deaths of so many Jedi, might have actually incentivized him to not allow Vernestra and the rest to follow in hopes of preventing further deaths. Kamir fixes his helmet and states that training Mei was a mistake, as her need for revenge was greater than her commitment to the master-pupil relationship more specifically, the power of two. The power of two refers to the Sith philosophy of the rule of two, which states that there can only be two Sith at a time, a master and an apprentice, an idea developed by Darth Bane. Always two there are, no more, no less. But another interesting thing to note is that Kamir calls it the power of two, which might hint at the Coven of Witches, who also use this one phrase in their chants. The power of two! And so this might hint at the idea that the witches were an offshoot, inspired, or perhaps even created by the Sith. Mei inquires about Kamir's scar, and we learn that it was his Jedi Master that did this to him, giving us a clue to his backstory. Although there was a part of me that wasn't so sure if what he was saying was trustworthy as he is a Sith after all. Assuming that it is true, then the scar on his back might actually give us a clue as to who his old Jedi Master might be which is a video for another time. Kamir encourages Osha to put on the sensory deprivation helmet, talking about how it's similar to the one they used as younglings, referring to the oversized helmets that the Jedi used to hone their senses through the Force. Master Venestra uses the Force to sense roughly what happened on Kofar, and we get some haunting dead looks from Jackie and Yord, which is quite disturbing to see. And Umbremeth tries to attack Venestra, who uses her light whip to defend herself, something which was already introduced in the High Republic books some time ago. Mox suggests Sol might be responsible as only a powerful fallen Jedi could have done this, hinting at how this could end with the Sith getting away as Sol is framed for the deaths of all the Jedi. And we hear her say, something to tip the scales, the same phrase she mentioned before in an earlier episode. 
Mei wakes up and Sol has a very dark demeanor, which really juxtaposes to how Kimir was treating Osha. Sol talks about how he had 16 years to think about what he would say to Mei, and the scene cuts where he presumably gets her to tell about her master's location. Osha tries on the helmet and in the background we can see what appears to be a vein of cortosis, which might suggest that the planet they are on is Baldemnik in the Outer Rim, a planet rich in cortosis. And Osha putting this helmet on will likely be helping her to fully reconnect with the Force, setting up her powerful return as a Force user in future episodes. It's also worth noting that her breathing underneath the helmet is somewhat reminiscent to that of Darth Vader. Anyways, that's all for this breakdown. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Be sure to like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. I'm the Lost Acolyte, and I have spoken.